Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Simon Center, and for those of you not from Stony Brook, to Stony Brook University. I'm very pleased to see all of you here for this edition of the De La Pietra lecture series. Uh, this, these lecture series uh, have been made possible by a generous gift from Stephen and Vincent De La Pietra and their families. Uh, the purpose of the lecture series is at least twofold, maybe manifold. Um, first of all, is to bring scientists to the Simon Center and to the Stony Brook campus, scientists who are doing interesting and important work, but also scientists who have demonstrated their ability to explain science to a more general audience. So while the lecturers are here, they give lectures to the math physics community at the Simon Center and also at our sister departments here on campus. But they're also a very important part of the lecture series are events like this, where the visiting lecturer explains some of the excitement of science to a more general audience. And of course, the purpose of this is to enhance the understanding and appreciation for science and what happens in particular here in Stony Brook University in science to a broader public and also to students. So I welcome all of you to this event. We're very pleased to have as our Della Pietra lecturer today, uh, Dr. William Bialik from Princeton University and also the Graduate Center of of the City University of New York. He was trained as both an undergraduate and a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley in biophysics. And he is currently the John Archibald Wheeler slash Battelle Professor of Physics at Princeton and a member of the Lewis Siegler Institute. And as I said, he's a visiting presidential professor of physics at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Professor Bialik's research interests have ranged over a wide variety of theoretical problems at the interface of physics and biology. He and his collaborators have shown that aspects of brain function can be described as essentially optimal strategies for adapting to the complex dynamics of the world. And I think maybe we'll hear some aspects of that this evening. Throughout his career, uh, Bill has been involved both in helping to establish biophysics as a sub-discipline within physics and in helping biology to absorb the quantitative intellectual tradition of the physical sciences. So I'm very pleased to welcome Bill here this evening and the title of his talk, as you can see, more perfect than we imagined, a physicist view of life. Bill? Uh, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've had uh, a very full and delightful two days, and um, I wanted to express my thanks both uh, to the Little Pietra family for their, their generosity in arranging for these things, and to my colleagues here for, uh, for the invitation and, and for their hospitality. I realized um, when I arrived that it, the last time I'd been in Stony Brook was, was 25 years ago. And um, a lot has changed, uh, all, all for the better as far as I can see. It's, uh, things are very lively, and, uh, but it is nice to see a few old friends who uh, are still here after, after 25 years. So I, what I'm going to try and do is to uh, give you a sense for a set of issues that my colleagues and I have been interested in now. Uh, for a very long time, and I think the best way to do it is just to plunge in. So I'm not going to give you an introduction, I'm going to give you an example, and then try and draw the um, ideas out of the example. So um, what you see here is uh, the head of a fly. Uh, this is uh, a little bigger than your typical house fly. And uh, what you're looking at are 
Uh, well, there are these sort of scary looking mouth parts once you blow them up to this size, but don't, don't, don't be worried about that. This is not a flesh eating fly. Um, mostly you see eyes. And in fact, uh, the sense that you get from this picture that flies are very visual animals is absolutely correct. Um, in fact, not only do you see eyes on the outside, but were you to look underneath uh, this uh, surface where the eyes are, uh, you would mostly see brain that was devoted to processing the information that comes in through the eyes. And what's a bit special about flies and other insects, and distinguishes them, among other things, from us, is that instead of having one big lens like we do, uh, they have lots of little lenses. And, and this leads to some confusion about how they see. Um, I, I recently had occasion to, to give this lecture to a group of, of undergraduates, and I realized that they may have the misfortune of having grown up in the era when Gary Larson was already retired. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a sad thing. So uh, there's a marvelous uh, two-volume set of the far side, the sort of collected works of Gary Larson, which I think should sit on a, on a nice podium, you know, a respected book that, to be referred to every now and then. And among other things in that volume, you'll see this, this remarkable cartoon. Um, and what's interesting about this cartoon is that, that Gary Larson uh, had a, has, uh, or expressed in his cartoons, a tremendous uh, feel for natural history and the, the phenomena of, of biology. Um, and so what's interesting is that he just got this one completely wrong. Um, the fact that flies have multiple lenses does not mean that they get multiple images. Uh, in contrast, what's happening, so grateful that you built a new building with blackboards rather than only, uh, I can't resist. Um, so in our eye, the retina is back here, and there's a lens. And if there's a receptor cell sitting in your retina here, it is, in a sense, looking out through the lens in that direction. And then there's a receptor cell sitting here, and it's looking out through the lens in that direction. And so in our eye, we get one image of the world, but that image is composed of many pixels, just like in your digital camera. And just like in your digital camera, all those pixels are, are collecting light that's focused through the same lens. The difference in the fly is that, if you want, you could imagine that this photoreceptor was the same photoreceptor it was in us, except instead of being embedded in the back of your eye, there's a little lens on top of it. And this receptor looks out through that lens and collects all the light coming from this direction. And this receptor looks out through that lens and collects all the light coming from this direction. So it's the same principle. You have many pixels, but, and the pixels correspond to the cells in your retina. But in us, all of the, the formation of the image is through one lens, and in the fly and other insects is through many lenses. Now, the problem with this is that those are very small lenses. So um, if we want to understand this, uh, we, should, we need to do a calculation. And so you know, physicists are beloved of simple approximations. Uh, there's a well-known joke, the punchline of which has to do with the case of the spherical horse. So this is not the case of the spherical fly. It's only the case of the spherical head, which is not such a bad approximation. So if you have a spherical head, and you want to look out at the world, and you build little lenses. So you're dividing the world up into pixels. And the smaller you make your lenses, the smaller the pixels are. And correspondingly, the more of them there will be. And just like you know, when you go buy a camera, you'll notice that the cameras you buy this year have more pixels than the cameras you bought last year. Um, so that's a good thing, right? So that tells you, make these lenses as small as you possibly can, and pack in as many pixels as you can. But that's not right, because it would be right if light traveled in straight lines. So if you could guarantee that this lens only sees the light that comes along a straight line passing this way, 
then if you made the lens half as big, it would see a smaller part of the world and you'd have a more detailed picture. And that would be great. The problem is that light is a wave. And uh, when you go home tonight, you can do this in your bathtub. Um, if you send ripples on the surface of the water and you pass them, right, that's a wave, just like the waves of light. And if they pass through a small opening, then although they started out going straight, and you can see that because the little wave crests are all lined up, it's not a great picture, but well, it's what I was able to find. I'm a theorist, so actually setting this up would be difficult. Um, you'll notice that as, they, as the wave passes through this little aperture, well, some of it stops, of course, because it hits the walls, but importantly, some of it curves outward. And what that means is that when you look, if you're forming an image with waves, as you are with light, then if you make a small hole, you don't only see the things that are directly in front of the hole. You also see the things which are a little off to the side. And that's only because light is a wave, or because these water waves are waves. And the size of the effect is related to the wavelength versus the size of the hole. And so by the, if you start making the hole smaller and smaller and in relation to the wavelength of light, then eventually this becomes a disaster and you have a little tiny hole that basically collects waves from all different directions and you've completely defeated the purpose of dividing the world up into little pixels. So the argument about making more pixels says make the lenses as small as possible. The argument about what's called diffraction through a small aperture says, no, 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 make the lenses as big as possible so that as much you're as close to the straight line approximation as you can get. This is why uh, good telescopes are now measured in tens of meters, right? So um, a rather bigger lens than we're able to carry around, but they have a harder problem than we do, okay? So if you want good resolution to combat the blur due to this bending of the waves, make the lenses big. If you want lots of pixels, make the lenses small. So that tells you that there's a compromise. You can't make them too big because then you don't have enough pixels. You make them too small, then you have too much blur due to diffraction. It's not a very difficult calculation to show that the best you can do is to make the lenses the size which is given by this formula where you take the size of your head the wavelength of light, multiply them together, and take the square root. And um, that's kind of cool. It says that the best eye you can build is one where the lenses are, have a size which is proportional to the square root of the size of the insect's head. Now, this calculation actually appears um, in Feynman's lectures for undergraduates, and he plugs in the numbers and he concludes that for a B, it's pretty good. You get it right within about 10%. But it turns out that a decade before this, well, actually, the origin of this idea is back in the 1890s, uh, not long after diffraction itself was understood. Um, people started to think, well, wait a second. If there's diffraction and I make the lenses as small as the lenses on insects, this must be a very serious problem. And so insects must have a very blurry view of the world. Uh, and that's true. Um, but what Barlow, realized in the 19, early 1950s was that if the best you can do is this, then we could find out whether organisms are, whether insects are actually doing this. You know, in some sense, does evolution know as much physics as we do in, in doing this calculation? So he went into the drawers of the Zoology Museum in Cambridge, England, and pulled out all sorts of insects of different sizes. And he plotted the size of the lenses versus the square root of the size of their head. And lo and behold, they're proportional. And in fact, even the coefficient isn't too far off what you would get. Remember, this is as if you were only Im making images with one wavelength of light. Really, there's a range. And so this is a kind of back of the envelope argument. And it gives you basically the right answer. OK? So what was it that I was doing by giving you that example? Um, well, let me give you another example, a different point of view. So another uh, favorite cartoonist in our house was uh, a fellow who draws Calvin and Hobbes. 
It's possible that Calvin and Hobbes is only funny if you've had a child the age of Calvin. Um, but, so this cartoon actually has a lot of things going on in it. There's a whole sort of subtext about gender roles in parenting, um, which is not what I wanted to focus on. But, uh, so, I, I'm hoping it's readable. Uh, you know, Calvin's curious, he sees this sign about the load limit on the bridge, and he's curious how they figure that out, and the dad, who's as confused as always, uh, explains that they just keep driving bigger and bigger trucks across it until the bridge falls down. They weigh the last truck and rebuild the bridge. Now, now this is a cartoon, but I hope you realize that this actually connects to a very widely held view. And this is, if you want, the view of technological progress by Edisonian tinkering. Right? So Edison was a great inventor because he just tried everything until he found the thing that worked. Right? He didn't design anything, he just kept trying until he found the right idea, at least that's the legend. Right? And he had a whole staff of people who were working at it. Um, and this is the view that is often presented to us of evolution itself. Just trying lots of stuff and eventually something works and uh, on we go. Nothing Nothing deeper than that. Um, in particular, right, uh, so I, I have a very strong feeling about this because uh, we raised our children in New Jersey, and um, every school child in New Jersey goes on a field trip to the Edison laboratories, and I actually think that this is one of the great disservices that we do for science education. Because uh, we, we leave them with this idea that that's science, right? That it's not actually possible to predict what would happen if you put this, you know, if you put electricity through this material and so on, which in fact is what we do now, right? And I challenge you to build devices like this um, by tinkering in the way that Edison did, right? It's just not gonna happen. So in fact, right, the technological progress that, that, we, en that we have enjoyed uh, is not the result of this kind of tinkering. What about, and in particular, <coughs> Um, since I'm a theoretical physicist and since this is a center uh, for things in mathematics and physics, I will point out that this view is completely anti-theoretical. Right? It's not only that they didn't calculate what, the load on the what load the bridge could have. The implicit assumption is you just can't do that. Right? Too hard. Well, you know, there's another view whose uh, 400th anniversary we'll celebrate in our lifetimes. Uh, so, uh, especially given your last names, I will not attempt to butcher the Italian, uh, but you know, this, this famous quote of Galileo's, which is usually paraphrased in English, that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, it really is much more eloquent, you know, philosophy, which was the name for the natural sciences, that is written in this, uh, grand book that continually lies open in front of our eyes. This is this speaking of the universe. Uh, of course, you have to understand the language and the mathematical language, which he goes on to enumerate with these triangles and circles and geometrical figures and so on. It's, uh, it's a much richer than, than the usual quote, but the usual quote gets the idea. Now, the point is that in physics, we're used to the idea that we look out at a broad set of phenomena and we have a theory and the theory allows us to predict many aspects of these phenomena. Of course, there are some things we, can't, we still can't do, um, some things that we really care about, like the weather, but um, we, actually, that's, we know the equations, we just can't do enough with them, right? Um, and alternatively, you could imagine that the world just happens to be the way it is. It's an accident, and um, there is no overarching theory. And to some extent, there's a view of the phenomena of life, which is of this flavor, that what you see in the organisms today is this sort of meaningless record of evolutionary tinkering. And um, the only alternative, apparently, if you read the newspapers, um, is to believe that there was an intelligent creator or designer. And so I'm hoping that by the end of this, you might believe that 
there is a path down the middle in which the phenomena have a meaning, the, the structures that you see in living systems are understandable, eventually, I hope, in some unified theoretical way, of which I'm going to try and give you glimpses. And um, nonetheless, you don't need, at least for this discussion, um, anyone pulling the strings. So um, what does this have to do with the example of the insect eye? Well, physics tells you that there are limits to how well you can build an eye. That was the point of that calculation. Turns out the real insects actually operate very close to that limit. They, uh, they can see with a resolution which is about as good as you can get given their size and the physics of diffraction. So that raises the question, are there, are there more examples like this? And if so, can we do in more cases what Barlow did, or what Feynman did 10 years later, in the context of the insect eye, which is to turn it around and say, if you wanted to build the best system you could, if you wanted to operate at the physical limit, then there are certain things you have to get right, and those constitute predictions of what the system should be like. In that particular case, the scaling of the size of the lens with the square root of the size of the head. So the agenda is to give you examples of real biological systems that are coming close to these physical limits, and at least some hints at this theoretical agenda of trying to turn this approach to the physical limit into the basis of a theory. And uh, over the course of the talk, I will say we many times, and uh, I think most of you know the admonition from Mark Twain that uh, the only people entitled to say we are kings, editors, and people with worms. And so to, uh, to exclude the one category about which you might have uncertainty, um, I should note that when I say we, it's because the ideas that I'm talking about really have developed over a very long period of time and have involved collaboration with lots of people, um, students, postdocs, uh, colleagues. Uh, and of course, one of the charming things is that the students and postdocs go off to be faculty members on their own and sort of eventually can migrate into this category, but this refers to where they started, not, uh, not where they are now. So we've been, my colleagues and I have been very fortunate to work with an incredible uh, stream um, of, uh, of people, some of whom are, are still working with us, which is why their, their destinations are as yet unspecified. It's not that, you know, nothing, it's not they didn't get a job, it's just they're, still, they're still students. Um, good. Uh, right. So here's an example, and I like this one because we don't understand it. It's always good to have one just to avoid any suggestion that lectures about science consist of a recitation of things that we know. Of course, that's not the interesting part of science. It's the things we don't understand that are interesting. Uh, most of you probably do know that bats uh, navigate through the world by sonar. They make these uh, little chirps of sound, which are at very high frequencies, much higher than we can hear. And then they listen for the echoes, and that tells them how far away different objects are. And by measuring the timing of the echo, they know the distance. And some of these, some species of bats also are sensitive to the Doppler shift of the echo, which arises um, because they're moving relative to the, to the echoing surface. Um, so in this scheme, navigating involves measuring the time uh, that it takes for the echoes to come back. Um, and so a natural question is, well, how accurately can bats tell the time at which echo, the echoes come back. And there's a beautiful experiment that gives you kind of first pass at the answer. And this is that you take a little mealworm, which, which bats like to eat, and you dip it in flour. Okay. Then you toss it up in the air, and the bat swoops by and eats the mealworm. Now, you may know that uh, bats are mammals. Their wings are like our hands, anatomically. And so when they bring food to their mouth, they actually take their wings, scoop it up, right, and use that to bring the food to their mouth. 
So in the act of doing this, the, the uh, flower-dusted mealworm leaves a little spot on the interior of the wing. So now let's do this again, same bat, different mealworm, and let's do it again and again and again. And then let's take the bat and open up the wing. And you might think that you would see lots of spots for every mealworm, but you don't. You see one. And that's because every time he does it, he hits the mealworm in exactly the same place, just like a baseball player or a tennis player. Well, I guess a tennis player would be a better, uh, better analogy here because the object is much larger than the ball. Um, and the fact that, the, that the, all the spots are in the same place means that the accuracy is certainly better than a centimeter. And since you're listening for echoes of sound, and sound travels a little over 300 meters per second, the fact that you can behave in a way which is precise to better than a centimeter immediately tells you that they are doing better than uh, their timing accuracy is at least 30 millionths of a second. Okay? Now that is, sounds really good, but actually um, we can measure about 3 millionths of a second of timing difference between our two ears, and that helps us know where a sound is coming from in this direction. And if we were barn owls, who actually make their living by listening for little rustling mice, um, then they could they, they can do one microsecond. And so Jim Simmons and his collaborators did a series of experiments which first showed that bats could also measure echo timing accuracy to about one microsecond. And then there's a series of controversies that surrounded those experiments. There's no doubt that they're correct, but there was issues about the interpretation that led them back to try and do experiments much more precisely. And what they discovered is if you do the experiment in the right way, and it's a complicated discussion about exactly what you have to get right, in fact, bats can detect differences in the timing of echoes of one hundredth of one millionth of a second, that is to say, ten billionths of a second. Um, this is, uh, as in my lifetime, the most astonishing fact that I've heard about biology. Um, I mean, there are a lot of really amazing things, but this one. Uh, the nerve cells in your brain, the characteristic time on which they do anything is one thousandth of a second at best. So this is um, 100,000 times shorter than that. Furthermore, you can calculate what the absolute limit is, assuming that the bat has complete access to every single detail of the sound wave coming from the echo, which is really implausible. And you can control what the limit is by adding background noise. So if you, start, if, you try, if you ask the bat to do this in an environment that's very noisy, it's got to be harder. And so you can dial how hard it is. And the performance of the bat tracks the limit that's set by the background noise. Now, the reason that I like starting with this one is because you know, we had this little nod to Galileo a moment ago. Some of you may know that Galileo actually tried to measure the speed of light. Um, before this, somehow, nobody had thought to do it, it seems. And um, what Galileo did was he had two guys with lanterns. And, and he had one of them open the lantern, and the other guy standing some distance away. And when he saw the light, he was supposed to open his lantern. And then, and then the other guy would, would make a little mark, because you know, he sort of starts his, they didn't have stopwatches, but you get the idea, right? I open the lantern, and I start counting. And then when I see the light from the other guy, that's taken two round trips. And so I know the speed of light must be the time it took, but right. OK. So we all know, yeah, you're, you're laughing, right? You know this doesn't work, right? Um, however, you may not know that Galileo reported his result as the speed of light is greater than whatever you calculate from this. So he knew that there was a limitation here that came from the fact that you know, people had finite, there's a finite speed at which you can do everything. And so you might just be measuring a property of you know, your ability to move the lantern up and down and not the light going back and forth. He understood that, and so he reported the answer as the speed of light is greater than. It took until almost 1900 before another measurement of the speed of light appeared 
that included the concept that the experiment might have an error in it. Okay? So although we can laugh at him for having tried something that didn't work, he also understood the limitations. If it were true that people were able to time things to the same precision that bats can, then the experiment would have worked. Because light travels a foot in a nanosecond, and so this corresponds to the bats being able to resolve timing on the, on the scale of the speed of light over 10 feet. We have absolutely no idea how this works. Let's try another one. Um, this is a fruit fly, um, or rather, had we not stopped it and put it under the electron microscope, it would have been a fruit fly. Uh, this is the egg of a fruit fly. It's about half a millimeter across, and it's undergoing, in the 15 minutes that are pictured here, um, uh, this is, yeah, right, so it's time lapse, right? It's about 15 minutes of real time, which we're looping over and over again. It's undergoing a process which is sometimes referred to as the most important moment in your life. Uh, the most important moment in your life is not when you're born, uh, it's not when you get married, it's not when you're accepted to the college of your choice, it's not when your children are accepted to medical school, whatever is the relevant joke for your particular ethnic group. Um, it's this moment, it's when you gastrolate. And that's because um, gastrulation is the moment at which, uh, this is a very appropriate topic for the Center for Geometry and Physics, it's the moment at which we acquire the correct topology. Um, we, we, as animals, are not simply connected, right? We have two exterior surfaces, right? There's the one that you usually think of, but of course, you also have an exterior surface on the inside of your mouth, which I invite you to think about where that surface goes. Um, it extends all the way through your body, and it had better because you have to be able to both eat and excrete, right? When you start, you're a ball of cells. In fact, this is not actually a ball of cells. You can't tell this by looking, but it's a shell of cells. So what's happened is I have the eggshell, and the egg, and that's one cell. And then one cell becomes two, which becomes four, which becomes eight, and so on. And after about three hours after the mother lays the, lays the egg, all of the cells are on the surface of the embryo. And the interior is hollow, well, it's filled with egg yolk, okay? And so gastrulation is the moment when this shell starts to fold in on itself in various complicated ways, of which the beginning is stopped right here. There's one furrow, that's not gastrulation, I'll get back to that in a moment. There's this furrow underneath, which is the beginning of this invagination, where the cells start to fold in on themselves. And eventually you'll end up with two layers of cells, one of which is your real outside surface, and the other one is the inside outside surface. Right? This is way too complicated. So we're going to talk about this little line right here. This line right here is the mark that says that's going to become the head of the animal, and this is going to become the rest of the animal. So this is the, the neck, if you will. And again, this is three hours after the egg has been laid. So how did the embryo know where to draw the line? When I look here, it seems like all the cells are identical. And there's thousands of them. And when I look here, apparently all the cells are not identical because, well, these cells became part of this furrow. And in fact, those cells, in some, in some sense that we can make precise, know that they're supposed to be part of the head. And those cells know that they're supposed to be part of the rest of the body. So you might think, well, no big deal. Just draw a line somewhere. But it turns out, well, look around the room. You'll notice that the different parts of your body they vary in size from person to person, but many aspects of the proportions don't change all that much. So for example, almost all of us have five fingers on every hand. Okay. Almost all of us. Happens, right? If you look at 100 embryos, you'll find that this line fluctuates in position 
by only 1% of the total length. It's extraordinarily precise. And here's a little blow up that shows you that there really is one row of cells in that furrow. And not only is there one row of cells, but it is a particular row of cells along the length, such that it only varies plus or minus 1% from individual to individual. Now, how does it know to put the line here? Well, what we've done here is to stop the action. And when we stop the action here, it looks like the cells are all identical, but if we stop even just a little earlier, we could ask, is there anything different about these cells that provides, in a sense, a blueprint for how to make the different parts of the body? And the answer is yes. There's an extraordinary series of experiments that, that go back to the late 1970s, um, which show that the different cells here have already made the decision to read out the information that's coded in some genes and not others. So every cell in your body has the same DNA and thus has the instructions for making all possible proteins that you can make. What we've done here is to take a picture in which uh, one of these proteins has been labeled green and one of them has been labeled orange. And you can see, is it possible to get the lights down just a little bit? Um, you can see that um, cells in along the length vary in whether it's really these that would probably be the problem. There we go. There we go. Um, that cells vary, and here's a little blow up, that you know, there's a cell that's decided that it's going to make lots of the green protein. There is a cell that's decided not to make the green protein, but to make the orange protein. And there are four of those in a row, and then four of these, and so on. And you can see, by comparing this picture and this picture, that this furrow which defines, if you want, the neck of the animal, is in between the first green and orange stripe. So not only um, is the system able to make very precise decisions about how to build its body plan, but it actually writes down the blueprint for doing this about an hour before it actually moves anything. And um, this blueprint is written down in the pattern of what's called gene expression. That is to say, how much protein do you make from each of the genes that you carry around. And the remarkable thing that was discovered by Eric Wieschaus and Yanni Nusslein Volhardt um, was that this blueprint is really carried for the entire body plan. This is, of course, also just only about this axis, but you also have to worry about the other axis. Uh, this blueprint is carried by fewer than 100 genes. So it's not, not so complicated, despite the fact that the, body the overall body plan is pretty complicated the number of different kinds of molecules involved in, in doing it is not so much. But let me just emphasize, I haven't really solved the problem. All I've told you is that, that um, this line is, corresponds to this feature of the blueprint. But OK, so the answer to how do you know to put the, the mark here is, well, there's already a mark there. But how did that mark get there? Well, in proper Freudian fashion, the mother took it, did it. Um, when the mother makes the egg, she puts the messenger RNA for one particular protein at the end where the head is going to be. So you may recall the information that's coded in DNA, in order to read it out and make a protein, you go through two steps. First, you make a molecule called messenger RNA, and then you tran and that's called transcription, and then you translate from messenger RNA into protein. So the mother does the job halfway makes the messenger RNA and sticks it at this end of the embryo. When the egg is laid, translation begins, and this molecule then, this messenger RNA molecules become the template for making proteins, and those proteins start to move through the embryo. What we've done here is to stop the action and stain for that protein, and you can see that it forms a nice gradient. It's got high concentration at this end, where it's being made, and lower concentration as you move along. And so you might then infer that the way cells know where they are along this length is, in a sense, they measure or they respond to the concentration of this molecule. So if you're walking through the hospital, you know that they have uh, paint on the floor that tells you which way to go to follow different paths, right? So you can think of this in this way. It's a little more subtle because you have to notice how dark the paint is. If the paint is very light, that is to say, there isn't much color, then 
which of course shows up as dark, which is a sort of unfortunate analogy, um, then you know that you're near the backside. If the paint is very bright, you know that you're near the head. And this molecule is one of those special molecules in the cell that helps other genes turn on and off. And so in particular, it turns on a gene, which is here, shown in red. And you can see that the, this gene essentially forms a threshold of this gene. It says, look, if the concentration of this protein is above this level, then I must be in that half. And if it's below, I must be in the back half. And so I've drawn a line. And so the mother turns position into the concentration of one molecule. And then the apparatus for regulating the reading out of genes is able to turn that spatial gradient into drawing a line. And I hope you'll trust me that if you keep going in this way, you can eventually draw lots of lines. Okay? And now, this is an old-fashioned experiment. A newfangled experiment is instead of stopping the action and staining everything, you just genetically engineer the fly so that whenever it makes this molecule, it glows green anyway. And that's what's shown here. So let me step through it once more just so you get a sense of what these experiments are like these days. Um, this is a live embryo. Um, and you might think it's not alive because we've sliced through it, but that's not true. What we've done is to just move the plane of focus of the microscope through the embryo. So if you focus near the top, you see this. And then as you go deeper, you see more and more of it. If you slice right through the middle, there's only one row of cells around the edge, as I mentioned. And you can see those cells are dividing. And so sometimes you see a few, and then there's more, and then there's more, and there's more. And you can see this gradient where the concentration is high at the head and then tails off at the end. Okay? And with these kinds of experiments, of course, you can be much more precise than with those kinds of experiments. So we can't actually see the individual molecules, but we know how many there are there because we know how bright these spots are. And so you can imagine that these two cells, which are right next to each other, they are sort of like this, right? There's a bunch of molecules inside this cell, and there's a bunch of molecules inside that cell. And actually, if you measure very carefully, um, you discover that this one has about 10% more than that one. And that's true all the way along. Two cells that are right next to each other have about, 10 about a 10% difference in the concentration of these molecules. So if you look at these two pictures from the back of the room, by now, you may, if you decided that was what you wanted to do, um, you might have counted and noticed that there are more dots over here than over there. But importantly, that can't be how it works. Because what these molecules do, there's nobody standing outside counting the molecules, right? What these molecules do is they go and attach themselves to the DNA and provide the signal that tells the cell to start reading out the information that's coded there. So there's nobody counting from the outside. There's some little guy sitting in the middle which is the gene that's relevant here, and he's waiting for the molecules to come to him. And so if you want to think about that, you can think about scaling up the whole problem. So this is all happening inside the nucleus, which is about six microns long, and the target that you actually have to hit on the DNA is about three nanometers in size. So this is millionths of a meter, this is billionths of a meter. So let's scale everything up so that the nucleus is the size of our neighborhood. It's a kilometer. Then in that case, the target, if everything scales, will be half a meter in size, this big. Right? So what this corresponds to is the statement that you want to figure out whether the student body at Stony Brook got 10% bigger by just standing there and waiting to see how many people run into you. right? Now, it's a little different because people don't actually move around at random like the molecules do. Um, and you might be able to do better by timing it so that you wait for classes to change and everything else. But you get the idea. You also get the idea it's not going to be so easy to do, right? Because it doesn't really, I mean, the fact that the campus is really big and you added 1,000 students doesn't help very much if you're standing here and waiting for them to find you. Right? It's true, if there are more of them, eventually you'll see more, but it's not very efficient. But that is, that is how it works. And so as a result, you realize that there must be a limit. right? It, if that's the only thing I can do, 
and I'm not allowed to wait forever for all of the students to walk past, to be really sure that there's been a 10% change in the student body might be really difficult. It would be easier if there were more people, so I'd count more. It would be easier if they were moving faster. Uh, it would be harder if the target was any smaller. And most importantly, it matters how long you get to count. Right? Because if you get to count for a long time, you'll get a better estimate. So these are all, all of these things translate into the problem for the cell. And there's a well-developed theory for what is the limit to the precision with which you can measure a difference in the concentration of these molecules. And the answer, after I mean, this took a lot of effort, um, is that this 10% difference in the concentration between two cells that are right next to each other is essentially equal to this limit. And even that, if you're not careful, you might think that things are too good to be true, that there really isn't enough time to get an estimate that this, that's this accurate. But it, it works, but only barely. And it turns out that the same problems are faced not just by embryos, by em fly embryos. They're faced by all sorts of organisms, from bacteria to the development of your own brain, where neurons are trying to, where as neurons develop, they're trying to find their way to their targets. And they, too, have to measure the concentration of various molecules that tell them where to go. And in all of these cases, it seems like the precision of the whole system is close to these limits that are set by counting the arrival of molecules that are moving at random. So I want to go back and talk about vision. And this is going to carry us through the end. Um, and I want to talk about vision, not the problem of forming an image, but the problem of being able to see well when it's really dark outside. So as many of you know, your retina has two kinds of cells in it. Um, there are the cones, of which there are three kinds that provide for your color vision that you use when it's reasonably bright. And then there are the rods, the imaginatively named rods, um, which uh, you use when it's very dark outside. It, by the way, cones really are cone-shaped. It's, it's very reassuring um, that you know, they're not just teasing us. Um, so these cells are packed with a billion molecules of the pigment rhodopsin, which absorbs the light. And when that molecule absorbs the light, that triggers a beautiful sequence of events inside the cell that eventually lead to electrical current flowing across the membrane of the cell, which is its boundary. And that causes things to happen way down at the other end of the cell, which can then pass a signal to the next cell in line, which you don't see. And somewhere in the basement are the cells that form the optic nerve and carry all this information out of the, of the eye to your brain. But let's stay here for the moment. Now, what's remarkable about these cells is that if you look carefully at their responses to dim flashes of light, you notice something very odd. This again, I mean, people knew to look for this, right? So it's not, there's a long history to this subject, which I'm not going to, um, despite the note, I'm not going to have time to tell you about. Um, this is a sequence of flashes of light marked by the tick marks. And you will notice that when the cell responds, sometimes it doesn't do anything. Sometimes it responds with one unit of current. And sometimes it responds with two units of current. The response of the cell is quantized. The reason it's quantized is not because of the cell. It's because of light. So light, uh, as we learned from quantum mechanics, it can, it's a wave, but it's also a particle. And the particles are called photons. And what you're seeing here is the response to one photon or two photons. The cells in your retina are capable of responding to individual quanta of light. And when they respond to an individual quantum of light, what's happening is that one of those one billion rhodopsin molecules is absorbing that quantum and changing its structure. And that one in a billion event is enough to trigger all of the chemical processes that lead to this nice, big, healthy current flowing across the cell membrane. And they make a measurable contribution to your perception. So the estimates are that under normal conditions, you will, are willing to raise your hand and say, yes, I saw something, when you count about five photons. And if I design the experiment correctly, I can convince you to say, yeah, I think I saw something when there was only one. Okay. And that's, again, it's a, it's a long and, and beautiful history. Now, 
The problem is that although these are pretty big, healthy signals, there's also this rumbling in the background. And you might worry that if you have to add up the signals from lots of cells, the rumbling could get bigger and obscure these things. But it's actually worse than that, because you'll notice that there's one thing here that I singled out with the question mark that has the slight problem that it came either very late for that flash or a bit early for that one. And early is not allowed, right? Because there's something called causality. And this is not a lecture about quantum gravity, so you know that causality will still be OK. And um, so this cannot be the response to that flash. And if you think about it, it can't be the response to this one either. In fact, if we just turn off the flashes altogether, you see one of these every once in a while. This happens at random. Why does it happen at random? It's because there's a billion molecules. And every once in a while, one of them does something spontaneously that it should do only when it absorbs light. In fact, if you were watching one molecule, you'd have to wait 1,000 years. But since there are a billion of them, it happens a couple times a minute. And that sets a limit on your ability to see in the dark. Because you can't tell the difference between these events and the real flashes. And then in addition, of course, you have this spontaneous rumbling. So how do you manage not to get, well, you can't not get confused. The question is, how do you get as little confused as possible so that you can see effectively into the darkest possible part of the night? Okay? And I think it's obvious why there's a benefit to animals being able to see when it's darker outside. Whether you're hunting or being hunted, it's a good idea to be able to see. So the answer is, well, part of the answer is that if I could smooth things out, right? if I could average over time, I could smooth out these fluctuations and make these events crisper. But of course, I don't want to smooth things out too much because then I'll lose the real events. And actually, I'll start to average in more of these spontaneous events. And then the other problem is that these things, although it's not obvious here because I haven't shown you a scale, these events are actually quite slow. And so if you'd like to know what's going on outside, it actually might be useful not to average over time, but to sort of unsmooth and compensate for the fact that these are slow events. Maybe try and mark the moment at which they started, rather than just responding across what's nearly one second here. So in order to separate the signal from the background of noise, you'd like to do some combination of speeding things up to compensate for the, the slowness of the cell's response and smoothing things out so that you suppress the noise. And there is a best way to do that, sort of do just the right amount of smoothing. And you can calculate what that is. And then you can ask, well, maybe when I just look at the next cell in line that immediately gets this signal, maybe it actually does the right amount of smoothing. And indeed, that's exactly correct. What's shown in yellow is the prediction of what the right amount of smoothing would be if you deliver a flash that gives on average, one quantum of light at this moment, you should get a response that looks like this if you're doing just the right amount of smoothing. And then the red squares show the actual response. And you can see that they lie perfectly on top of each other. And let me emphasize that this is not making a model in which we get to adjust parameters. The predicted response for doing just the right amount of smoothing is entirely a consequence of the statistics of this rumbling fluctuation, the shape of these events, and the frequency with which these spontaneous events occur. And so there are no free parameters to adjust. But nonetheless, you get an essentially perfect description of how the cells respond. So this is evidence not only that the system is coming close to the physical limits on its performance, counting every single photon, but that it's actually doing a calculation whose structure we can predict by insisting that it be able to do that without knowing anything else about the underlying mechanisms. So in the same way that Barlow was able to predict that the size of lenses should scale with the square root of the size of the head, we can predict what the shape of this impulse response should be. Let's go back to where we started with vision in flies. So, we saw there's beautiful eyes. What do the flies actually do with the visual signals that they collect? Well, they do lots of things, just like we do. But one thing that's very important for them, since they are, after all, flying, 
is that they use the visual information that they collect to estimate how they're moving relative to the world. And you can listen in on the nerve cells that are essential in that process. And what you find is, like all nerve cells in the brain, they respond with these discrete pulses, which happen about 30 times a second, and they're about a thousandth of a second wide. And what's happened is that through several layers of processing in the visual system, the fly has extracted from all of the data that it's collecting an estimate of how fast things are moving across the visual field. And in a sense, it has written down that estimate in this sequence of action potential. So there are two different problems here. One is, how do they actually estimate the motion? And the other is, what's the structure of the code by which their estimate of velocity is written in this pattern of action potentials? So um, my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time on both of these problems. And many years ago, we showed that um, we'd gotten to the point where we really understood enough about the code that we could read it. So we could read the action potentials that were being generated by the neurons and predict how fast things were moving across the visual field. And you can see that although we're not perfect, we, all, we get it right more often than we miss. And in fact, you can ask, well, how big are our errors? And the answer is that you know, there's a minimum level of error. Because after all, the lenses that the fly is looking through have a big problem with diffraction. And so they have a blurry view of the world. And they're not collecting that many photons. So the receptor cells give very noisy responses. And if you try to figure out how things are moving when your view of the world is blurry and noisy, there's only so well you can do. And it turns out that the fly is doing within a factor of two of this limit. And we were, too. We were able to read this information out with an accuracy that's within a factor of two of this limit. And of course, it's possible that the factor of two is our fault and not the flies. Maybe we're just not smart enough to decipher what's coded in these spikes. But we got pretty close. Now, the idea was that if a system is performing close to the physical limit, then it's got to do something in order to make that work. Not, so for instance, if you think about trying to calculate how you're moving relative to the world by all this data you take in through your eyes, if you do the wrong calculation, you'll be nowhere near these physical limits. So what's the structure of the correct calculation? Well, that was a problem um, my student Mark Potters and I spent some time working on. And let me um, illustrate something about the answer. And there's a very important, and this is where I'll wrap up. There's a very important aspect of what it means to make the best estimate. And that is that when you're dealing with data which are very, very noisy, like the situation that the fly finds himself in as he flies through the world, you can't be perfect. All you can do is trade off between the different kinds of mistakes you make. So for example, if you're trying to detect something, you're trying to decide, you know, is there something over there that I should pay attention to? If the data aren't very good, then you can never be perfect. All you can do is trade off, you know, do you want to make the mistake of every once in a while jumping when there's nothing there? Or do you want to make the mistake of missing things that are actually there? And you can trade those against each other, but you can't make your error rate go to zero. So similarly here, the fly can't make his estimate of motion be perfect. All he can do is trade off against different kinds of mistakes. And roughly speaking, the different kinds of mistakes can be categorized into random errors and systematic errors. Random errors are where you sort of get the right answer, but you kind of bounce around it. And systematic errors are, well, the real answer is here, but you're always over here. And the point is that you can make your systematic errors bigger, and then you get less random error. Or you can do it the other way. You can make your systematic errors smaller, but then you get more random error. And the compromise to minimize your errors altogether always involves accepting a little bit of systematic error. But systematic errors in your visual perception have a name. They're called illusions. So if the fly does the optimal computation, he will suffer from an illusion of motion. 
in which he will think that something is moving even when there are no moving objects. And so what you see here is simply random noise. But then maybe you see something else. There are no moving objects here, trust me. Okay? Absolutely no moving objects. Now it should be moving the other way. Um, what we're doing is taking completely random flickering images, two of them, except that one of them is ex the exact copy of the other one with a little delay. Okay, so on every frame of the movie, we draw all the things at random, but we do it the same way for both frames, for both halves, but with a delay in time. And then what we do is we put them on top of each other and add them up. And they're on top of each other with a spatial displacement. And if the, spa and if the spatial displacement is large, well, if it's really large, they're not on top of each other. So let's make it smaller. And somewhere around here, the spatial displacement is a couple of pixels, and you see something moving. And if it's only one pixel, it moves about half as fast. And if they're just on top of each other, then that's noise. And if the displacement is minus one pixel, then it moves the other way, and so on. Uh, I hope you all suffered the illusion that there was something moving, and I assure you that the fly does too. And by experiments like this, we can start to dissect the whole structure of the fly strategy for computing motion and convince ourselves that it really is doing something like the calculation that we predict it needs to. So the point is that we can take the observation that the system does nearly does, a does an estimation problem nearly as well as is allowed by the physical limits and turn that into a principle from which we can derive the structure of the computation that the organism actually does. And it seems like we're right, that that is the computation that he does. So what do we do from here? I hope I've convinced you that there are lots of situations in which biological systems come close to the physical limits on their performance. In this sense, they're near to being perfect, okay? near to being optimal. And if you don't take anything else away from the talk, I hope you take away an appreciation for the incredible precision with which many of these systems seem to be operating, which frankly I continue to find surprising um, as we find more and more of these examples. And the examples really span many layers of biological organization from bacteria up to our own perceptions. The question is whether all of these things really add up to a theory or whether it's a long collection of anecdotes. And as one of my, my wife spent some years on the Board of Education in Princeton, and one of her colleagues there who was a distinguished statistician once remarked, the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> and so uh, in the context of controversies surrounding education, I think you all know what he was referring to, or at least can imagine your favorite example. We have the same problem here. You know, in physics, we're so used to the idea that there are big unifying principles and that many phenomena are described by the same theory that we forget that when we go to another setting, we're not sure about that anymore, right? What I'm showing you is that there are lots of examples that all point in the same direction, but I don't know how many of these I need before I can say, yeah, there's a theory for the whole thing, right? And that's where we're struggling right now. And we're thinking that the the idea which really unifies this is not really about, you know, these all sound very specific, but what's in the background of all of this is this is all about the flow of information. So for example, could we go back to those, those beautiful pictures of the fly embryo and ask ourselves, if there are all these different molecules that are affecting each other in different ways, can I find the interactions among the genes that actually optimize the transmission of information about the position of a cell along the axis that I was showing you. What I was talking to you about was the noise in discriminating between two different positions, but presumably what the organism really cares about is the total amount of information it has about position. And so we and other people are trying to uh, develop these theories of optimal information flow in genetic networks. And at the same time, one would like to understand whether as you think about the processing of information in the brain, it's not so much that you're interested in computing motion or some other particular, or just counting photons and deciding whether there's a light there or not, but that maybe what you're really interested in is the total amount of information that you have, either about the state of the world at the moment or the state of the world in the future as 
you try to make predictions about what's going to happen down the line. So again, I hope I've convinced you that the world of biology, the phenomena of life, offer us examples of incredible precision. And uh, I don't think it's inappropriate to say beauty. Um, and that these are, of course, this is not the beauty of our theories, but the beauty of nature. And that this near optimality of these many different systems provides us at least with a hint of where we can look for a theory that could, with a little luck, begin to fulfill the Galilean vision of reading those now missing chapters in the book of nature. So thank you. nature tinkers at all? Or is everything optimal, or does something start off suboptimal, but over evolution they get better and better? And do we, you have examples where things are not as good as they might be, but you can imagine they would evolve to something better down the road, or maybe this creature yeah. left behind because it didn't compute as well as you know, some of its slightly mutated brothers and sisters. So, um, part of the difficulty that we face in all this is that we know how to do these, pro and actually this isn't, this is a much more general problem, right? Biological systems are very complicated. They're doing lots of things all at the same time. So if you ask yourself, what do we actually understand about how the brain works? The answer is, we understand situations in which you can say that in this part of the brain, you do this part of the problem. And the better the isolation of the part of the problem, the better our understanding, okay? Because if you go to the part of the brain where everything's all happening at once, eh, we just, you know, we, we, it's just hard to make progress. So I think the same thing is happening here. What I'm picking for you are examples in which the hard part of the problem is easily isolatable. And thus it's clear what the system wants to do and what the limit is. Those cases probably have been subject to enormous evolutionary pressure for a very long time. Okay. And so that's why we're seeing this. Um, you know, there are bacteria that can count single photons so that they can swim up to the light um, because they do a version of photosynthesis. So, um, you know, this is very old. Uh, what I would say is that, right, what's not clear at all from this discussion is how you do any more global optimization. So, for example, I mentioned that it would be much easier to distinguish a 10% difference in concentration if there were just more molecules around. Now, presumably, the reason there aren't more molecules around is because it's expensive to make them. But why did the system make this particular trade, you know, of making this many molecules and thus having to work really hard to achieve this level of precision? That's a more global trade-off. And again, I'm, I'm losing my ability to isolate the pieces of the problem, and so I don't know how to do it. Yes, what, what you call the near optimality of nature is, Darwin called the mystery of mysteries when he wondered that uh, why organisms seem to be uh, perfectly or near perfectly adapted to their environments. And there's this unifying theory that he described it as evolution by means of natural selection. So, um, so the problem is, <laughs> well, theory. so. Um, so, evolution by natural selection is presumably the dynamics by which the system finds its way over billions of years, hundreds of millions of years, to the structures that we see today. It could have been that we are in all senses in the middle of that process. And thus, we are nowhere near anything like an optimum. And then in that case, the state that we see today is completely determined by our history and not by any more general principle. On the other hand, if evolution has been efficient enough as an algorithm for optimizing that it gets us close to the optimum, then the structures that we see today are understandable as optimal solutions to the particular problems that today's organisms face. <laughs> 
So the goal is, so evolution by natural selection by itself doesn't allow you to predict any of these things, right? It tells you that if these things contribute to fitness, they'll, pr they'll probably get better. But it doesn't predict where we'll be, right? And actually, um, it doesn't, so for example, if I told you that this network of genes transmits more information than this network of genes, and that information is good for fitness, then you can say, yeah, yeah, evolution by natural selection will pick this one instead of that one. But you actually had to do the calculation to show that this network gives you more information than that one. Right. And Darwin didn't do that part. Right. Yes? I don't remember back to the 1950s, but they were interested in then, in night flying. Yes. Used to hover around electric lights, and they could actually see flashes of light from the alternating current, which, of course, humans don't do. And I'm wondering what could be the evolutionary advantage of moths being able to do that way before the electric light? Was yes. Done. So, um, <laughs> presumably, they did not evolve for this, right? <laughs> what is true is that insect visual systems are much faster than ours. So my friend Rob Dreuter, with whom I collaborated on all this work uh, on motion vision flies, has a hell of a time actually showing a movie to a fly. Because if you use anything like the things that we normally have around the house or even around the standard lab, um, what you see in the responses, so I showed you uh, what um, these neurons look like. If you simply put the fly in front of a television, no matter what you see on what is showing on the television, these pulses will simply come in sync with the redrawing of the screen. Okay? Just like the moths who could see the alternating current in the. So um, what's true, so the, the, the story about the moths and the light bulb is a demonstration that the insect visual system has much higher time resolution than we do. Remember, because of the little lenses, they have much poorer spatial resolution, but they have much better time resolution. Um, and that's true, and that has an obvious, uh, um, I mean, there's sort of obvious reason for this, which is that the signals that they encounter tend to change much more rapidly than the signals we encounter because they're flying. And actually, there's a, there's a fine point. Um, if you're flying, <coughs> The signal that's right there in front of you, that doesn't change with time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the signal that's over here, that's changing really rapidly. So if you look in detail at the cells in the, fly, in the fly's eye, you discover that the cells that are looking this way, and actually flies don't move their eyes, so this is well defined, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the cells that are looking in the direction of flight actually have slower responses than the cells that are looking that way. Because if you slow your response down, you can average more in time and suppress any random fluctuations. And since the signals aren't so fast, that's to your benefit in this direction, whereas in this direction it's not. And we even understand molecularly how that's achieved. Well, if there are no more questions. Uh, we have one more. Let's so an interesting example from optics. The lens of the eye is a radial variation of the index of refraction. Yes. It so minimizes the spherical aberration. Right. So the what my remarks about um, diffraction in the insect eye come nowhere near. I mean, it literally just scratches the surface of all the wonderful optical tricks that nature has discovered um, in building eyes in our own eye and in insect eyes and. Uh, also in you know, birds of prey that have very high resolution and so on. So there's, there's a remarkable, one could do very well um, to uh, study optics by just surveying um, all the remarkable features of eyes. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and let's thank our speaker. Thanks.